It's August of 2022, and Sarah Jacqueline King is celebrating her birthday with her husband, her golden doodle, and a few friends. And she's having a splendid time. Her apartment is in a suite at the Wynn Las Vegas, and it's a picture of luxury. There's caviar, cupcakes, frosted with Dior's logo, and even a cake shaped like a Chanel handbag. One of her friends, present at the house, a woman named Amal Obeyed Schmid, wishes Sarah a happy birthday, and both women look like perfect best friends. But that was was last year, and things have now changed. For one, Amal Obeyed Schmidt no longer thinks the world of Sarah. In fact, she now hates Sarah. And that hate is connected to who Sarah Jacqueline King is and how she scammed her way to a celebrity lifestyle in Vegas, spending $10 million of other people's money. Before meeting Sarah King, Amal Obeyed Schmidt lived a relatively calm life as a trauma surgeon in California. One day, she and her husband met Sarah and her husband at the Wynn Hotel in Vegas. Before long, the couple started building an amazing friendship. Soon, Amal and her husband began to host the Kings at their homes in the Los Angeles suburbs. Sarah and her husband also reciprocated and hosted Amal and her husband at a house party in Vegas. However, Sarah's house wasn't some quiet and boring apartment on the corner of the street. It was a huge villa. Amal and her husband were in awe of Sarah's extravagance. After a while, Sarah convinced Amal and her husband to invest in her business. King Family Lending. The business was supposed to provide funds to third-party lenders for wealthy clients. Amal completely bought into the idea, so she and her husband invested their entire life savings. Perhaps the reason why Sarah was so good at selling the idea of a phantom lending business is that it wasn't the first time she'd done it. Sarah King had already successfully scammed LDR International Limited, a British islands firm, into loaning her money for this fake company too. LDR International started extending business loans to the King family family lending in January 2022. Under the deal they made, King Family Lending was supposed to use the funds for loans for third-party borrowers. In the 10 months that followed, LDR International gave King Family Lending about 97 loans, which totaled over $10 million. But King Family Lending wasn't lending any money to third-party lenders. Instead, Sarah took all that money, rented a villa in Vegas, and gambled all the money away. Because that's what you do when you get $10 million for your lending business. Sarah King's ex-husband is Cameron Pallavi. Pallavi once owned a restaurant in West Hollywood and has made a career out of developing hotels in Morocco. Before Pallavi fled the country in light of his ex-wife's lawsuits, he spoke to LDR International and substantiated all their claims about Sarah's operations. Pallavi was the one who introduced Sarah to LDR International. His rationale was that he wanted her business to grow and he believed the best way it could grow was for her to get access to credit. The facade of Sarah's life began to crack when Pallavi noticed that some of the bank documents she sent to him about her business were forged. He and his friends began to look closer at the statements and soon found out other inconsistencies that suggested that the documents were fake. The statements were altered to show payments to third-party lenders that were never made. The worst part is that these statements made it to LDR International and the company continued to finance King Family Lending off those fake statements. Sarah didn't depend on just fake statements to defraud LDR International. She also used pictures taken with with NFL stars to gain some credibility by showcasing her celebrity clientele. Some of the stars she took pictures with include Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen. Unfortunately for LDR International, the pictures were just pictures and meant nothing. LDR International continued to approve loans for King Family Lending, and Sarah continued to spend those loans. Eventually, she'd spent almost all the money, so she had no choice but to go back to the company and ask for another tranche of loans. When she made these requests for extra cash, she would forge documents about the third-party borrowers the money was supposedly going to. Sarah also lied about the personalities the loans were going to. NFL, NBA, and MLB players, among other very wealthy people. She once said she was giving a loan to a superstar hairstylist for the Kardashians. In the process of perpetrating her fraud, Sarah told LDR International that she'd gotten about $6 million in loan repayments, but had used those funds for other loans. But there were no loans there were no loan repayments. Amal and her husband first met Sarah at the Wynn in Vegas. When they met Sarah, she was dressed in very expensive designers like Dior and Chanel. She gave off an aura of wealth, and Amal was immediately blown away. The couple got talking, and Sarah began to reel them in with interesting tales. She talked about her previous job as a lawyer. She told Amal that she'd litigated for many years and had put a lot of bad people behind bars. But lawyering was too stressful, so she switched to owning her own lending business. 
business. From that day forward, Amal and Sarah became extremely close friends. So close that Amal and her husband even gave Sarah advice about marital issues. In due course, Sarah made her move. She told Amal's husband that she was willing to allow him to invest in her company as a favor. She told him that she only dealt with big clients like professional athletes and billionaires, but she was willing to give him the opportunity because of how close they'd become. Sarah explained that the business would be simple. They invest a certain amount of money, and Sarah would lend that money back to athletes and sports stars who didn't want a loan showing up in their bank account. These loans went to purchasing gifts that these stars wanted to hide from their records. The loans would then be paid back with fantastic interest. Amal and her husband were convinced. Sarah was a close friend, and she certainly knew what she was doing. Amal also knew where Sarah shopped, and it was apparent that she was an extremely wealthy person. The pair got so close that when Sarah's birthday came around, Amal decided to get her earrings fashioned in her favorite number, eight. But their relationship went sour a few months later after Amal discovered that Sarah wasn't going to pay back their investment. Sarah signed a number of promissory notes, forged documents proving that she'd paid, and even lied that her ex-husband was preventing her from making the payments. But one thing she didn't do was pay back the investment. All of this came as a rude shock to Amal. She trusted Sarah with her life, and she'd been repaid with the worst sort of betrayal. While all this was going on, someone identifying themselves as Haler began to send puzzling emails to Sarah's victims from Sarah's email address. Haler claimed that Sarah was incapacitated and that she'd been empowered by Sarah to reach out and settle some matters. This mysterious Taylor also somehow promised Amal Obeyed Schmid a Lamborghini. The vehicle never came. Another of Sarah's victims, Yumi Sturdivant, also got an email from Taylor, but this letter was filled with insults. Maybe Sarah told Taylor that she didn't just like Sturdivant and that much. Yumi Sturdivant and Sarah King go way back. They met while working at a real estate firm back in 2017 and then decided to quit to start their own marketing agency. They lost touch in 2021 and only reconnected in early 2022. When they reconnected, Sarah immediately offered Yumi an investment opportunity. Sarah explained that by just investing $10,000, she would be able to double the money in three days. It was too good to be true. Yumi didn't want to send the money at first, but she eventually fell for Sarah's lies and sent the money. She never got it back. After Yumi wired the money to Sarah, Sarah started posting pictures she had with Yumi on Instagram. The pictures were a way to continue to emotionally blackmail Yumi, and it showed just how heartless Sarah was willing to be. Another of Sarah's victims is George Poulos. George loaned Sarah around $125,000, and the cash was never repaid. George loaned Sarah the money for interest in a yacht. However, that never materialized. In the process of getting his funds back from Sarah, George realized that he wasn't the only victim. He also learned that Sarah had used the boat she promised him as collateral for several other loans that she didn't even actually own the boat. George did carry out his investigations before loaning Sarah any money. He'd visited her home to see the collateral she'd put up for the loan, and at the time, they all seemed legit. The last George heard from Sarah King, she was willing to settle. However, that settlement never materialized. Another victim of Sarah's fraudulent business was the founder of a California makeup line, Mana Kadar. The founder of Mana Kadar Cosmetics is now alleging that King persuaded her to part with $62,000. Apparently, Sarah used her position as a lawyer to gain Miss Kadar's confidence and then convinced her to invest cash into King Family Lending through loans. To make the offer extra juicy, Sarah first put up her engagement ring as collateral, then claimed she needed it back, so she offered an Admars Piguet watch instead. Of course, it turned out that the watch was fake. Sarah King's exploits in the world of multidimensional fraud only got popular in 2022, but that doesn't mean she hadn't been playing the game long before then. Mayor Casillas Berger was working at a Californian beauty store when she became friends with Sarah. One day, Sarah invited Mayor over to the exclusive Balboa Bay Club and asked her to become a personal assistant. In time, Mayor began to notice that Sarah was always on the run from her business partners. They always wanted to speak to her or book an appointment, and she always found a way to wriggle out of it. In the meantime, Mayor moved in with Sarah and started traveling the world with her. During this period, Mayor noticed that Sarah might not sleep for days and would leave the house in the middle of the night. She also shut her phone off fairly regularly and went no contact for days. This was very puzzling behavior to Mayor. However, the puzzle was solved when Sarah scammed her as well. In November 2021, Sarah took $5,000 from Mayor during a work trip to Vegas, abandoned her at a casino hotel, and then ghosted her. Apart from collecting $5,000, Sarah also used Mayor's credit card to purchase first-class tickets to Hawaii. As expected, Sarah never repaid the money for the tickets. Despite constantly being on the run from multiple 
multiple creditors, Sarah still managed to live a life of absolute luxury. Mayor frequently accompanied Sarah to expansive garages where the most luxurious cars were parked. Sarah claimed that these vehicles, some of which included Bentleys and Rolls Royces, belonged to her. She also went on shopping sprees at designer stores and took weekly chartered flights to a private airport in Las Vegas where she claimed to have high-level business meetings. Most of the payments for these expenses were made in cash, and Mayor, her assistant, was tasked with not only basic assistant work, but also with picking bags of cash up from the bank. But Sarah wasn't just interested in money. She also sought status in her quest for wealth. That's why she got herself into the Gen Next Foundation, a conservative-leaning Newport Beach-based nonprofit. However, members of the foundation saw right through her act. They quickly realized that although Sarah looked like she had a lot of money, she behaved in a way that suggested that she was just nouveau rich. Sarah once asked the members of the foundation, who were at lunch at the time, if they wanted to see her new Bentley, the hallmark of someone who recently came into wealth and was still managing the luxury that came with it. If you're enjoying this story about Sarah, definitely stay on this video to watch our previous release about what happened when these two sisters decided to go after a billionaire. While Sarah wasn't good at blending in with high society, she was expert at coming up with excuses. She gave so many excuses that it's really hard to keep track of all of them. When George Prulo started searching for her to collect his money, she had Mayor tell George that her grandmother had passed. At the time, Mayor started seeing just how fake Sarah was and even thought that Sarah was somewhat sick in the head. What allowed Sarah to get away with these excuses was that she was good at getting people to believe her. She had so much charisma that people believed anything she said, no matter how insane it was. Aside from making excuses, Sarah also loved playing with people. Many times, she gave Mayor little tests to see if she could make something happen. Once, she sent Mayor to a high-end restaurant in Orange County that wouldn't do takeout orders to collect a salad for lunch. Mayor complained that the restaurant didn't do takeout orders, but Sarah insisted that she make it happen. Surprisingly, Mayor did make it happen. However, she had to tell the hostess that Sarah was a psychopathic boss first. On their last trip to Vegas, Mayor saw Sarah lose $40,000 playing at the high stakes roulette table in 15 minutes flat. Once the $40,000 was exhausted, Sarah asked Mayor to borrow $5,000. Mayor obliged as she wrongly believed that she would be reimbursed. That night, Sarah put Mayor to another test. She asked Mayor to get her stuff from a room in the hotel despite not having a key. That meant that Mayor had to find a guard that liked her enough and believed her enough to open the doors with an extra key. It seemed impossible, but Mayor eventually did it. When Mayor brought the luggage to meet Sarah, she didn't even acknowledge her or pretend like she'd completed some important task. She simply took the bags and told Mayor to go on leave. So Mayor went on leave and stopped hearing from Sarah. When she started texting Sarah for the money she was owed, Sarah's answer was simple. She didn't owe Mayor anything, as she'd taken Mayor out and paid for a lot of dinners for her, so they were even Steven. Of course, this affected Mayor profoundly. She'd built a very close sister relationship with Sarah. It was the worst sort of betrayal. So what's Sarah King up to today? No one knows. We do know that she's still somewhere in Las Vegas, gambling away money borrowed from others and maybe taking some more pictures with important people. We also know that about six casinos have banned her and are on the lookout for her. Beyond that, no one knows much else. Her creditors are still asking questions. No one knows when or if they'll get their answers. Canadian divas Jyoti and Kiran Matharu had their eyes set on a luxurious lifestyle. They wanted it all. Shoes, makeup, jewelry, private jets, and soon all their wishes would come true. When Kiran turned 21, she met a Nigerian businessman while working at her job. They got into a relationship, and shortly after, he introduced Jayoti to his friend. It turned out that his friend was a Nigerian petroleum tycoon and wanted to fly her and her sister out to Nigeria with him. While their relationship blossomed, the sisters had the experience of flying on a private jet to Greece, France, and finally Nigeria, where his drivers took them to a mansion. While Kieran relaxed by the pool, Jayoti was given all sorts of expensive gifts, including a $10,000 monthly check. Jayoti's boyfriend even bought her an expensive condo in Toronto. But once they had a taste for luxury, the hunger would grow. And this was only the beginning for the Matharu sisters. Jayoti and Kieran have never been the types to care about what others think of them. They were born into a middle-class Indian family who migrated to Canada. Living in Toronto, their life was overall normal. 
While Jayoti was romantic and passionate about literature, Kieran was level-headed and excelled in math and science. The two were inseparable and always dressed up to go to school. After high school, the sisters applied to a two-year fashion, art, and business program while working part-time jobs, sharing clothes and a car, and working to bring their fashion brand to life. At night, they spent their time at clubs, wanting to live a life inspired by Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie. At this point, they had planned on eventually finding love, having a big Indian wedding, and settling in Toronto. Then, Jayoti met her Nigerian executive boyfriend, who swept both sisters off their feet and into Nigeria. The sisters claimed it all happened so fast that there wasn't even a moment to question if everything was real. From there, they continued going to Nigeria to meet future wealthy boyfriends. Once they find out you have a sister, it's over, said Kieran, talking about how easy it was to find men who would lavish them with riches. Taking a look at their Instagrams, their lifestyle is the definition of luxury. Brands such as Bottega, Veneta, Gucci, Prada, and many more fill their closets along with accessories. They also have pictures wearing all their expensive items in their Rolls Royce driving through the streets of Dubai. They ended up with so many things that they eventually converted their Toronto condo into a walk-in closet that resembled a high fashion boutique. There were walls lined with over 70 pairs of designer heels and glass wardrobes filled with bags and purses. They had custom rose gold jewelry and diamond watches easily worth more than a car. And did they use their own money to buy it all? No, not at all. The only time I go shopping is when someone gives me their credit card, said Kieran, meaning these two were essentially sugar babies documenting their lives on social media. By now, they have about 80,000 followers collectively who mostly praise them for the lifestyle they live. The similarities between them and the Kardashian-Jenner family make it no surprise that the media gave these two the nickname the Canadian Kardashians. The two sisters quickly grew accustomed to their new life. Once you live with money, it's hard to go back to a life without it. And with how things were going, they would never have to. They put their dreams of a fashion brand on hold to make time for the men willing to provide for them. They even had expectations for the men they dated. They were attracted to the power wealthy men in Nigeria and their position on the Forbes billionaire list. It didn't matter if these men had wives or children either. The tabloids loved the Canadian Kardashian sisters and claimed they were the most provocative women in Nigeria. But even provocative women have standards. These rich men would have to spoil them and fund their expensive tastes in life if they wanted to date them. It seemed like the perfect life for someone who wanted to be a sugar baby. It wasn't until their last trip to Nigeria that things took a turn for the worst. Both sisters woke up one morning, and after having a shower, they heard a loud knocking on their hotel room door. A group of men barged in, demanding that the two go to the police station for questioning. Confused and frightened, the sisters refused to go with them. You can still find the photos taken of them in their bathrobes online. Plainclothed police officers took these photos. Nothing was provided when the sisters asked them to provide proof of identification. Instead, the officers claimed that they would take them in their bathrobes if the two of them did not get dressed. In the end, they were forced to comply and taken to the station with the fear that they were being kidnapped. When they got to the police station, officers accused them of owning a popular gossip blog called Nejasit Live. This site is known to spread scandalous rumors about Nigerian elites and accused the sisters of prostitution. Kieran and Jayoti denied being the owners, but the police did not believe them. From here, the officers drove them to another police station belonging to the anti-robbery squad. According to a 2016 amnesty report, this station was known for its corruption and use of torture to extract confessions. When the two arrived, they claimed to be put into a dimly lit room while an officer demanded they sign a confession to owning the gossip site. Nejatsit Live was written in Nigerian Pidgin, a language neither girl spoke. When the girls refused to sign the confession, they were forced to a cell. Eleven other girls stayed overnight. The following day, they were taken to a hotel room near the airport and guarded for 18 days. They found out they were accused of threatening to kidnap and blackmail wealthy Nigerian elites, including the politically powerful oil tycoon Femi Otodola. Femi Otodola was the controlling shareholder of Forte Oil. In Nigeria, they have over 500 gas stations as well as a gas-fired power plant. In 2015, he was number 16 on Forbes' 50 richest Africans list. He was also Kieran's ex-boyfriend. The sisters claim that 
Otadola was angry because they rejected his advances to rekindle their relationship. Otadola then filed a request for police to find whoever owns Magic Seat Live, claiming they were using nude pictures to blackmail elites. Their suspects? The Canadian Kardashian sisters. While the sisters were in detention, officers brought them to Otadola's home, where, according to Jayoti and Kieran, he supposedly forced them to record a video confessing to owning the website and apologizing to him and his family. He promised that if they recorded the video, he would provide them with their passports and let them leave for Canada. After recording the video, it was uploaded to the internet and the girls were still not given their passports back. During this time, the gossip site's Twitter was posting even though the officers confiscated the sisters' electronics. The owner even eventually took down the site in order to prove that the Matharu sisters weren't the owners. After posting bail and waiting for weeks in their room, the sisters were finally allowed to travel back to Canada with emergency travel documents claiming that their bail didn't restrict travel and that their physical safety was at risk. While back in Toronto, the two sisters stayed off of social media with hopes that the whole fiasco would die down. The media exploded with unofficial facts about the sisters, being, let's just call them ladies of the night, as well as calling them gold diggers and scammers. After seeing their names get raked through the mud, they decided they'd had it. It was time to fight back and clear their names. They posted all of their evidence, along with their side of the story, on their lifestyle blog, Matropolitan. They contacted City News to give a 30-minute interview discussing what they went through and their feelings toward the media. They claimed that none of the news media had reached out to get their side of the story, so Jayoti and Kieran reached out to them, threatening to sue if the companies didn't print retractions. Jayoti and Kieran knew that many backlashes came from society's tendency to frown on a woman who allows herself to be single while being lavished by men. People hated them simply because they didn't like how they lived, but the sisters didn't care what the consequences were as long as they could clear their names. And just when they thought they were in the clear, Jayoti was told by Canadian customs officials that she couldn't travel to the United States due to an arrest warrant on her passport. Meanwhile, her sister Kieran was traveling to Italy to do some furniture shopping. While waiting for her luggage, Italian customs officials locked Kieran in a room without food, water, or explanation. After eight hours, officers finally told her that she had a flag on her passport from Interpol and that she was being placed under provisional arrest. Police officials held her for 40 days, waiting to be deported to Nigeria, but the paperwork never came. Kieran was allowed to travel back to Canada. Philip Adabawali, the Nigerian police officer who initially detained the sisters, was the one who issued the warrant for their arrest. He claimed he didn't conspire with Otodola or demand bribes, as the sisters had mentioned. When asked why they didn't send the extradition paperwork for Kieran, he blamed it on the Italian police and bureaucratic errors. When Kieran returned to Canada, the two sisters pleaded with Interpol to remove their names from the red alert list so they would be allowed to travel again. Everyone knew this to be impossible without a lawyer, but the sisters felt they could accomplish it. While waiting for Interpol, the sisters decided to let their Instagrams flourish with photos of them wearing designer items. During this time, an American man who was a follower of Jayoti reached out, asking if she would like to start a fashion company. He lived in Dubai, but since the women weren't allowed to travel, he was willing to come to them. After months of waiting and fighting, Interpol sent them a package package containing a letter letting them know that Interpol had deleted their names from the list. This meant they were free to travel again and had done so without a lawyer. The American man, who they have decided to keep unnamed, booked a flight for Jayoti to come to Dubai. After a stressful and sleepless flight, she was delighted that nobody was waiting to arrest her at the airport. What started as a business meeting quickly blossomed into a romance. Again, Jayoti found herself being taken care of by a wealthy man. One night, Jayoti wore an orange dress created by Kieran. This dress mesmerized the man who encouraged them to move to Los Angeles to start their fashion career. After all the scandals, the sisters now had the ability to realize their dream of creating a fashion brand. Now, the sisters own a clothing store called Spectrum Studio where they sell the clothes that Kieran makes. When advising others going through a public scandal, they remind people to be the one who tells the story, be transparent that nobody is perfect, and when people ask questions, answer them. They have learned from their experience and no longer mess around with Nigerian princes. In a wild turn of events, they have turned a scandalous story into a successful business, genuinely living up to the Kardashian name. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below what you'd rather do. Gamble at least $1,000 at a casino in Vegas or spend $100 at a bar in Vegas.